Good afternoon, everybody. So welcome to the session here on My Neighbor, the Factory. I'm Max Lemke. I'm the head of unit for digitizing industry in DG Connect, and I'm here on behalf of Mrs. Lucilla Scioli, who was originally foreseen the director in, in our DG on, on this topic, but she couldn't make it because you can imagine we now have meetings with the new commissioners. And this morning there was one with Mrs. Goulart, who was talking to the digital side of her portfolio. So I'm here to chair this session. I've worked on this topic before, so I would like to, before I start, I would like to, and I see Jürgen coming in, that's exactly at the right time. This, this session was co-created by DG Research and DG Connect. And that's something that is happening here very well, and we do that since seven years now, and we do that quite well, I would say. So it's a good tradition of working together, co-creating, and co-designing things. Yeah, so I think I would like to also say that because that's not true across all the portfolios. So here we are doing this since quite a while. So when it comes to the, the topic, my neighbor, the factory, we have to think about what does that mean. And I just put some buzzwords up and I would leave it to you to tell us a bit more to shed some light on that. I, sometimes there is the word urban manufacturing, decentralized manufacturing, mass customization, customer driven manufacturing, co-design, co-creation, fle flexibility, agility, bringing back manufacturing to Europe comes in as well, re-industrialization and so on. So we will, we will discuss that a bit and we will also try to see what does research and innovation in the future to do with that? What, how can we help that this happen? What trends do we want to see? So it's not... F it, we do not address here bringing the refinery into the city center or bringing the dirt into the city center, bringing the big steelworks into the... This is not what we talk about. We talk really about these new concepts that are possible due to new technologies like 3D printing, artificial intelligence, all the automation type things. So we are looking at that. So we focus on manufacturing and production here in urban, urban setting. We, 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 try to, we want to keep a bit the perspective of the people in, in this whole process because that's one of the, of, one of the reasons for it. And, and production sites closer to the customer. I think that's an important point. Uh, one buzzword is like creation of co communities around products. And we have in mind businesses, SMEs, in particular also startups, consumers, and education closely to each other so that we can be more creative. And, and, and then the workplace comes in and how people work, the ways of working, the kind of jobs. And we also see kind of changes of these jobs coming with the, for example, with the digital transformation. So new products, digital and circular economy on, and we will look a bit into the technologies as well to allow this manufacturing closer to residential areas. Just one brief statement on an example. I mean, you may all have heard about this Adidas Speed Factory in Ansbach. That's a typical example of where 500,000 shoes are manufactured close to the customer, where we get customized products, where we reduce significantly the supply chain and the time to market, the time to the shop. So the, the one who wants a new pair of sneakers either has to buy it off the shelf or normally he has to wait for months until he, she gets it. And, and this is really shortening that to weeks. And I think the idea thinking is that there should be a system in the back shop that prints the remaining part of the, the shoe, or prints that part of the shoe which is customer. Uh, customized, prints that in the back shop so that the customer can take the shoe home directly afterwards. So that is a bit the dream and, and, and uh, so that's one example on where this is happening. But all of this is a bit controversial. Do you want your, a factory as your neighbor? Do you want to live next to a factory is the question. While people don't want windmills or uh, wind energy, Next to them, they may also know, not want these kind of factories, at least not giga factories, but small ones we will see. But how will the citizens react? I mean, we see that with artificial intelligence, the whole ethics discussion. If we don't get the citizen with us, 
it will never work. Yeah, so, so that's why we have this AI ethics discussion in parallel to the innovation discussions on AI. So if we will only do innovation with AI, citizen will be lost and we will not be able to do it. And, and the AI discussion will come later and be in the way. So it's important to do that in parallel. And I think for this topic, it's as well important to, to see that in parallel. And perhaps at the end, it's not really we talk about urban manufacturing, but getting more getting production capacities closer to the customer. That's what we, what we are talking here about. To, to address the customer needs, as I said, maybe in fab labs, makers labs, living labs associated to that, to bring them closer. And at the end, it's also about competitiveness, bringing production back, some production back to Europe. But as I understand from the Adidas factory, for example, it's a significant amount but still a very small percentage of what is done in Europe. But it's the first step and it's a good example. So this, with this introduction, I would like to invite uh, the speakers now and I would like to uh, give the floor to Björn Sauter of Festo AG to give us a kind of 10 minutes keynote introduction. And uh, yeah, you are with Festo Research Corporation, so you are on the research side, and that very well fits into the intent of this meeting, of this, this event here. So please, go ahead. So thank you very much, thank for uh, Max for your kind introduction. So you have said almost everything, so I <laughs> wonder what I could tell you uh, new here. Um, yes. Uh, I'm working for Festo. I have studied regional sciences a long time ago, and now I'm working for Festo. It's a German family-owned company which provides solutions for factory automation. And as a regional scientist, I know that factories are not acting in isolation. They are strongly embedded in their regional environment. They depend on their neighborhood. They depend on local factors. And also our owner family of Festo, they are well aware of the of their local roots of the role of the environment of the creative creative milieu of the innovation ecosystem uh, and their role for the long-term business success of the festo company which is almost 100 years old now so all these demanding customers these excellent suppliers the excellent universities and notably the skilled workforce in the surrounding has been the key ingredients for the business success so Companies and factories in general, they are depending on the neighborhood, on their environment. And I just want to give you two examples from factories in my personal neighborhood where I'm living. I'm living in Stuttgart. This, this is an industrial urban area in the southwestern part of Germany. And recently, a brand new factory has been opened two kilometers away from my home. It's from the Porsche company. Have you? heard about Porsche, the sports car manufacturer. Maybe you've also heard uh, that they launched some days ago the first full electric car, the Porsche Taycan, as a competitor to the Tesla. And the Porsche company decided to build, to produce this Porsche Taycan in a brand new factory, close to the headquarters, in between a residential area and a local recreation area. So there has been a long, close uh, dialogue with the neighborhood, with the municipality in Stuttgart, and Porsche had to fulfill high regulations regarding environmental aspects. So what do you think? Why decided Porsche to invest millions of euro in this high-wage region with these high regulations? Well, it's clear they wanted to have close distances to the headquarters, but the main argument was they wanted to have to keep the skilled workforce which is living in the surrounding. Another example also from a German factory, a uh, German company called uh, Wittenstein. It's a uh, company headquartered in the rural area. And some days, some uh, years ago, they decided to build their new production not close to the headquarters in the rural area, no in the Stuttgart area, in the middle of a passive houses green residential area. So it's an integral part of this green residential area. They build also, for example, playground for the kids in the neighborhood. 
what was their motivation? They wanted to illustrate that modern production is a low emission production, it's uh, highly efficient, and that it nicely fits into this green approach of uh, passive houses. But the main argument here also was they wanted to have the skilled workforces they need for their high-tech production. They didn't get this workforce in the rural area close to their headquarters, but they found it in, in this urban area. So the lesson learned for me from this story is we should not try to bring the people to the factories, but we should bring the factories to the people. And if we are looking into the future, how the factories of the future in our neighborhood could look like, we have to look at various mega trends, more uh, societal driven mega trends like urbanization, customization, um, the increasing awareness uh, of the people concerning uh, ecological or social, social aspects. So in the future, the majority of the customers are living in urban areas that demand highly customized products which have to fulfill ecological and social criteria, so green products, fairly produ produced products. And uh, on the other hand, we have got uh, technological developments, uh, digital technologies, which enable us to, to, uh, to design, to engineer these highly customized products in the virtual environment, so digital, digital models, and new technologies like 3D printing, Max men mentioned it already, which enables us to produce these highly individualized products close to the customer. So in future, we will see more and more individual manufacturing facilities close to uh, the customer. And Max mentioned this Adidas shoe production as an example. We have got also another trend. Um, we will have in future also more and more highly automated factories where still people are needed. So we are talking about human-centered factories, so we need still workforce. In the future, we will see more and more highly automated uh, manufacturing fa factories close to the workforce. In these both um, scenarios, the speed factory on the one hand and the highly automated factories on the other hand, they have the potential to bring back production, for example, from Asia to Europe. Uh, regarding shoe industry, we see it in Portugal, the Portuguese uh, footwear industry was really flourishing um, during the last years because they modernized their factories, they are able to uh, produce these shoes on a highly uh, competitive manner, manner. Um, and this is the future, also the competitive advantage of Europe from my perspective. In future, we will be able to organize these cyber-physical production systems in a way that they are highly productive, energy efficient, resource efficient, and these smart factories are embedded in a manufacturing ecosystem, in a broader network, also with relations to the smart mobility or smart energy systems. So we will see more and more circular value streams, shortened transportation uh, distances, so uh, relationships to logistics, to smart mobility. We also see factories as an integral part of uh, smart energy systems, smart grids. Waste heat, for example, from factories could be used for heating the housing uh, in, in the neighborhood, just to give you some examples. So we see manufacturing systems, ecosystems, not the factory as such, as uh, one standing uh, um, issue, factory systems. And this brings me to the conclusions, to the research priority, which we need from my personal perspective, three research priorities. Priority number one, we need better understanding of how these systems work. Maybe we can learn from, from nature, from biology, from ecosystems, and transfer these systems, uh, these uh, concepts to our manufacturing ecosystems. Second, systems engineering. We need the, cap the ability to design, to engineer such complex and resilient manufacturing systems which are simple and easily to handle, so I call it simplexity. Priority, Priority number three would be, uh, I call it technological intelligence, so we have to harness the full potential of digital technologies to uh, collect the, the data and to analyze the data and to enable us to, to implement zero waste, zero emission production processes. 
And this technological intelligence brings me to the fourth priority, which is human intelligence. So people, it's all about people. Factories provide good jobs, but the job requirements are changing. And we need a really good education that we get in the end the competences and the workforces we need for our high production of the future. And here I think we need uh, also new forms of a dialogue with the neighborhood, with the uh, broader public, to erase the awareness that smart factories are not contradictory to good and healthy living conditions. No, I, I think smart factories are prerequisite for a good and healthy living in a sustainable environment. I think we need more discussion about factories in our neighborhood, and this is just the starting point. I'm very welcome, uh, and this session I'm very looking forward for the discussion with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for the introduction. I cannot pick your points up all, but one point, I think it, you mentioned labor and you mentioned that it, it doesn't mean the smart factory doesn't mean it's all automated. The human is in the loop and there will be jobs lost, but there will be new ones created and that means lifelong learning, special education skills. So education and the skills development is a key part yep. of it. So I would like to hand over to Ena Waute, chairman Chairman of the board, chairwoman of the board uh, of Robo Valley F Foundation of the Technical University in Delft. And I understand you will tell us a bit of what opportunities you see for distributed manufacturing sites and manufacturing close to customers from your experience in Robo Valley. Well, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, and also thank you for uh, painting the bigger picture within which we are working. What I would like to do is to share, if, uh, yeah, bear with me a few minutes uh, more, uh, talking about bottom-up initiatives. And in the end, I think we see a lot of new technologies. Most of them have been mentioned, whether it's 3D printing, or you can do machine learning, or you can use robotics. There's various forms. There's a lot of knowledge around that actually we don't use a lot yet. Uh, on the other hand side, we see in Europe a lot of needs, Yeah, what I call um, upgrading in your market. So people would like to have personalized stuff, not things that sit on a boat for six weeks until they have arrived from China. Uh, people will, are willing also to spend more and more money on this. Um, to make things uh, yeah, suitable for themselves. You even nowadays see, uh, see companies that uh, hack IKEA furniture to make it specifically fit your house. Which, which means actually they take 90% of IKEA furniture and they adapt it a little bit, so it suits your uh, suits your need. So I think that is uh, that is that is coming up and it's got to do with with more customized products. And whether that is actually a customer or a consumer that wants to, has these demands or it's an SME, it doesn't matter so much. I think you can you can see them in the in in the same manner. So the market changes. The market needs are changing. And all of that happens to fit also what we need globally because we uh, need to to transport many, yeah, much less products throughout the world. The third factor actually that it needs to make this, to get this going, is that you need entrepreneurs, or you need manufacturers, you need creative people that are willing to explore, that see needs and maybe see technologies that can get them there and that are willing actually to experiment there. And I would like to, uh, to take you through a few examples. Uh, I think one of the uh, one of the programs from the Horizon 2020 Factory of the Future is already indicating that uh, there's a lot of agility in manufacturing possibilities. Um, and one of the, one of the things we do is we explore this in Robo Valley. Robo Valley is actually a foundation that tries to bring together the knowledge we have on robotics, not just physical robotics, can be AI as well, um, and the needs. Uh, 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 yeah, the people actually need this knowledge. So we've set up something, it's like a living lab. It is like an exploration area. We have startups actually in the building. We have an area where people can just explore. We do courses for companies uh, to make sure they get a feel for, they know they need to do something with robotics, but what? So we do, do exercises with them so they can find out themselves. Um, and at the same time, we do um, student projects in the same building, where we also try and educate the people. And this is, this is creating an ecosystem, which I think is very important uh, for us uh, nowadays. Um, another thing we do is we're working pretty intensely also now in the EIT manufacturing, where we work together with, uh, with a bicycle maker, and bicycles are not produced in the same quantities as cars might be, uh, but there's loads and loads of different types of, uh, of, of bicycles, so you can, do, you can imagine that you can do robot-assisted assembly. So you don't have large quantities, it will not be totally automated, but these robots have to work with people, the other people in the factory. How are we going to do this? Why not experiment? 
And the third example I would like to, made, uh, like to mention is, um, is in a living lab called Next Ultra Personalized Product. We do quite a few things because we have a 3D scanner. Actually, it's a 4D scanner. It can scan your body, but also for 20 seconds, so it can do a little bit of movement. And we've made fantastic suits for athletes that need to be aerodynamic. Uh, we've made uh, helmets for people that are just perfect fit for, for their head. We've made um, braces to prevent people from spraining their ankle. Um, and we're actually are making tailor-made uh, jumpers with a knitting machine, with a knitting robot. So you have a 3D scan and you have an absolutely nicely fitting pullover. Um, so that, that is happening there and I think that is, uh, that is uh, important. So in the end, I think what we need is, n is knowledge needs to meet needs and needs need to meet knowledge. And we have to, f to, to think through explorative areas, and whether that is a living lab or whether that is also an educational institution. Ideally, actually, it's a mix of it. And also, that sits in the valley of death, so not a lot of people are willing to pay money for it because it's not clear yet what's going to come out, but we have all this knowledge that we can work with. So we need to fill that gap, actually. The valley of death needs, uh, needs spaces to evolve itself. That's where I would like to leave it. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank, thanks, Inna. Thank you very much for, for, for this perspective from research and the meeting of needs with, uh, with technologies and vice versa. So I think that's, that's, a, that's an extremely good point. Now we go one step further. Lisa Ann Sheehan of the pro program manager at the Irish Manufacturing Research. And when it comes to di di distributed manufacturing close to the customers, how can we make sure that the speed of technological development isn't much faster than, than the uptake? I mean, this is one of my pet topics when I talk about digital innovation yeah. hubs and, 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 and these kind of initiatives to, to support the uptake of technology from yeah. a technology perspective, but rather from the need perspective, as, as you have described. So maybe you can give us some view from that perspective. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story and uh, propose uh, a few questions uh, to you for reflection. Um, I'm first going to tell you a little bit about my neighborhood, a neighborhood that's pretty representative around Europe, a small city, you know, lagging, some might say, on you know, the periphery of Ireland. So my neighborhood, uh, the place I consider mine, um, is the city of Limerick um, in the west of Ireland. Uh, it's a place uh, dominated by um, even milder and uh, temperatures and even wilder winds most recently. Um, I suppose we have some beautiful landscapes, silent hills and some very, very noisy streets at the moment. It's an urban center um, that's in decay, which is pretty common. Um, you know, with um, an expanding rural uh, way of living dominated by the diesel engine. So fast fashion and uh, I suppose creaking infrastructure are pretty commonplace. And most cities probably don't want to announce these things, uh, especially in public forums. Uh, but this is the case, and the case in many places. I suppose the factory for me um, was a, mystery, a mysterious place, I suppose, hidden by logos um, in a kind of industrial cluster, um, usually on the periphery uh, of the urban area. Uh, kind of adding to that donut effect, uh, you know, heavily reliant on motorized transportation to move goods and people. So this place is now my workplace, the Irish Manufacturing Research Centre in an industrial estate um, where I too uh, commute quite long distances to get to every day very far from when you know, I used to be able to walk to work, uh, cycle to work when I was an urban planner. So I want you to take a little moment uh, just to think about your neighborhood where you live and about the factory that you understand. And think about uh, the reality of those places 
and the potential rhetoric that is out there in relation to those same places. So I get to see my world now through the eyes of an urban planner, working in a manufacturing research organization, doing all of the things that the guys are talking about, robots and AI and helping SMEs and all of that. Um, I suppose we are primarily focused on supporting industry to digitize and regional growth. I see the pressure that's on the regional actors on a daily basis to compete and to attract um, in a world that we have made. But, you know, at what cost, I suppose, is the question. Over the years, I have had the pleasure and, and the pain of working in beta. So, uh, where intended users uh, get to try out new products and services and be observed, a kind of a citizen observatory, if you like. I've done this across many domains over the years, uh, smart city, smarter travel, creative limerick, capital of culture, neighborhood regeneration, oh, it's, it, it goes on, uh, green leaf, green flag, digital innovation hubs, all of this. So these innovation actions that I've been involved with, you know, rarely realize their kind of intended vision. Um, that's what I've observed of a digitized, sustainable, circular community uh, naturally kind of supporting um, social, environmental and economic stability, especially where I live uh, in Ireland. So the gap I see between the European policy and local action, or some say implementation, is pretty vast, uh, but especially when it comes to spatial planning. So those spatial planning decisions take a generation, if not more, to fix <laughs> um, and are quite lagging when it comes to the advances we're making right now uh, in digital technologies. So I have some final points. Today I'm here with you to discuss a policy approach which supports a kind of a mishmash of functional zoning that opens up opportunities for exchange and sharing, uh, closing the loops, and a more distributed scale, where the factory kind of returns to its roots, super local, <coughs> nourishing the neighborhood. So, I suggest we are now Two seconds. Um, in a time where um, we have the means, so we have the technology to support live, work, make homes and innovation hubs in the neighborhood, um, enabled by digital technologies and a more optimized governance. A regulated or a deregulated, sorry, playground connected to the grid, open. Uh, to the built and natural environment, where neighbours are at the heart, protected and encouraged to invest. Invest in the skills, their education, invest in their enterprises and co-create the future, I suppose, that we need right now. So, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I think you picked some key points when I think about our strategy on digital yeah. innovation apps, which I think is very important, the link to the region to see to really respond to the needs of the region rather than a top-down approach. So yes. we try to address this with cooperation with uh, regions, also a bit with a financial stick saying we want to co-finance so that we really do what you want and not just give money for what we want mm -hmm. because we, we need to come together. But I think there's much more on that, as you said, innovation hubs in neighborhoods and that's much smaller entities as we can usually Consider So thank you for this inspiring example from, from Ireland, or in, expire, inspired by an example. And I'd like now to go to Ma Martina Zabo, the uh, Vice President of Manufacturing of 
cup components. And what would you think are the f are your key benefits and business models for creating a manufacturing system in a residential area? So business models, I think, is one of the buzzwords that are coming up today in all the discussion about digital transformation. New business models, disruptive, disruptive uh, business models. You sell value rather than products, not even services, but value, like what, what Rolls-Royce did by power, power by the hour. There are these examples of new business models, so maybe you can inspire us a bit on that. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it is also a pleasure for me to meet you as uh, co-speakers here. Um, yes, uh, I have the pleasure to give you a bit of an overview how we at Kapsch Components have, so to say, survived in the urban surrounding and why we are still located in an in a urban setting. Um, I'd like to summarize it a bit with uh, three key factors which I think are important and tells our story why we are producing and how we are doing that in that urban setting. So first key point from my point of view is automation. The second key point is the link, the close link in between product development and production. And the second and uh, the third one is the low emissions. So um, production, so Kapsch is a road telematic um, company and technology company. And Kapsch Components is the electronic manufacturing company of that. Um, Captures a long history of producing products, but uh, over the year um, we have um, developed in a way the technology change was very dramatic. So if you remember historic production places, there were a lot of um, mostly female workers who were pick and placing all the components and they have um, assembled them to finished products. So a lot of manpower, a lot of labor intensive work has been done. But during the day, we were not. But during the time, we were not competitive anymore. So um, we had to think about new solutions, and one of the solution was, of course, uh, to highly automate our production. Um, we use, of course, a lot of components, by the way, from Festo. Um, so automation, I think, is uh, the crucial point why we are still here, um, uh, operating in a European uh, uh, environment. And um, yeah, in a way, uh, automation saves jobs, but uh, it creates new ones. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind when I come to the second part. Um, when we removed in 2008, because our location site didn't fulfill all the criteria for the automized production anymore, so we were in search of a new production site. And one of the requirements of Mr. Kapsch was that he wanted to have a close link in between product development and production. It's that crucial because uh, there are raised a lot of issues in, um, in a prototyping phase which needs to be addressed. And both of these teams can solve these issues easily. And so the, the close link um, is important. And the development department uh, was or is still in, in Vienna. And so we found an industrial site an old industrial site, because in the 70s and 80s, a lot of companies have been in Vienna, has been in the town. But um, I think uh, I've read once a study, 70% of these industrial uh, companies from the secondary sector, um, they were uh, went bankrupt or, bankrupt or uh, moved to uh, low-cost countries. So we were gladly to found one of these uh, production sites, industrial sites, and we moved there with the um, automation, uh, which we have finally adopted our processes. And we benefit a lot from the distance or the sh short distance in between um, product development and production. And we benefit a lot of the qualified employees, which we can find in an urban setting. Um, we have close contacts, of course, also to um, universities and institutes. And we benefit, of course, a lot of the transportation and logistics uh, which an urban setting has available. So that's my, that's my second part. And the third part is um, I'm, I'm fully aware that not every production uh, sector can be uh, integrated, well integrated into an urban uh, setting, but for electronic production, um, is it possible because we emit only low emissions, uh, we don't have any industrial noise in a way, uh, we don't have uh, any process water in a way. Of course, we use a lot of electricity, um, but um, in the environment where we are located, we are fully accepted because we also um, 
uh, agreed to have only shipping of materials during daytime, so it's well integrated and I think, uh, yeah, you have to interfere with all uh, stakeholders and um, uh, to, to cooperate, excuse me, with all stakeholders and yeah, that's the reason why we are, we are very well accepted. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for, for, for the three points, automation, products and production and energy. Maybe products and production, I think digital technologies like digital twins are key enablers for that because when we talked about them first, we had a digital twin of a product, then we have a digital twin, twin of production. But what really adds value is when you, when you bring them together so that a change in product trickles through directly into production with the human being in the control of the, of, of the whole process. So I think that's and also the examples of being well integrated, the energy aspect, that's extremely important. Thank you very much. I understand now from the Regie that you would have a poll. Do you want to bring that poll up now? Okay, so, so we'll have a poll and, and uh, when you're on Slido and there's the number on the screen, hash R900, maybe you could try to answer these, these questions and we see a bit later what the answers are, maybe even outsiders can do that. So let's have a look at the answers on this. Which aspects of future distributed manufacturing systems or urban manufacturing is most important to focus on EU level? So it's a bit the input you give us for the design of the new programs. You know next year we'll come up with first work programs under the new uh, programs and we need input for you and this is a first step to tell us a bit where we where we should go yeah this is one way of of consulting so then I would like to come to some questions that we can discuss maybe with you but also with the audience so I would like to have some comments from you now, when we, we have talked and we heard a lot about placing factories in urban environments, you have mentioned energy, but there's also the environmental footprint of, of factories, clearly. And will the citizen accept that? So I would like to ask uh, you maybe on a, on a short point, very brief, on citizen acceptance and environmental footprint. I think that's closely related. Maybe you have a comment on that. And I would like to have the audience as well to either give, uh, pose a question or to comment yourself, but I would like to limit you to one minute per intervention. I, we, we don't want long lectures, we want crispy interventions. So I would like to ask you to really be crisp in your comments so to give everybody a chance. So environmental footprint and the acceptance by the citizens. Maybe, maybe you go. For, one of you goes first. Who would want uh, to? Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah. So, um, as you know, all resources are important, and all resources are expensive. Um, we thought about uh, for our manufacturing to um, to use them as efficient as possible, and we raised uh, one of the programs um, where we should, where we have um, decreased our uh, resource input. So uh, we were able to decrease the input from 2010 to 40 percent. That seems a lot, uh, but it's due therefore because we have modernized the industrial complex that much that from lighting, climate, uh, climate control conditions and so on, we were able to save um, a lot of, of energy on that point. And we also did um, change a certain process. Um, as you might know, soldering is when you have a lot of uh, um, uh, thin in a in a 240-degree um, kilogram pot uh, heated up 24 hours, but there are different uh, new solutions to that soldering. And for example, we introduced a laser soldering process, which only indicates a certain amount of energy for one dot, and that saved us also a lot. So a lot of uh, continuous improvement is necessary to stay resource efficient. Anyone wants to compliment on the, maybe on the environmental or the citizen side? So, uh, I suppose what we're trying to do is um, have large-scale demonstrations of some of these activities in the Innovation Hub, uh, which is open. So the Innovation Hub interacts with the neighborhood's energy systems, uh, heat exchange, etc and showcase this to uh, the factories uh, so they can de 
de-risk uh, and kind of demystify some of those uh, future investments that they might make in their factory based on uh, some good examples um, and real world examples uh, based on an, an older uh, factory building uh, which needs modernization can't be from new. Okay, so, thank yeah. you very much. You want to compliment? Maybe one, one small comment. I think it's always a matter of giving and taking. So yes, of course, you, you might take some, maybe you have more traffic in the area or so from the city, but you also have to give something like jobs. So and that is something that needs to strike a balance. And uh, there's always ways to, to help each other. Eh? So I don't know, local swimming pools, pools heated by the solar cells on the, on the roof of a farmer or whatever. There's always ways to help each other. And I think they're necessary. I think it's very good that you mentioned this balance, taking and giving between the citizen and the factory. We see that as well when we look at what we do on artificial intelligence at the moment. The taking in terms of uh, protection of your own data. If we protect everything to death, there will be no innovation. So we have to find the right balance between them. And I think that's important that the citizen also understands that, that the citizen doesn't go in one or the other direction, but takes a balanced yeah, approach. Yeah, understand and notice. And notice, yeah, and, 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 and this may be also not driven by only by the, the more one-sided comments they may get from some parts of the society. So, you want to add or...? Maybe, yeah? uh, if, you, if you've got uh, one minute. Yeah, um, yeah, I think also from FESTO perspective, envir environmental footprint is a key factor for citizens' acceptance. Uh, we've uh, moved our own major uh, factory from the headquarters uh, some years ago uh, because it be uh, the, the, the facility became too small, so we have to move it uh, some kilometers away, adjacent or nearby a uh, natural park protection area. So high regulations, so it was important to have such a low emission factory um, and security and safety also became very important. But also when we talk about commuting the traffic and the transportation, also Festo tried to, to contribute to, to reduce the, um, the traffic. Uh, and it's, uh, we call it corporate responsibility. So it's clear the factory, the company is also responsible for its environment and, and the neighborhood. Uh, and on the other side, as you mentioned, the city in this uh, uh, case, it's Esslingen. Uh, it's also, uh, they realize they, that they benefit from the factory. So it's a balance. That's so clear. the benefit for the citizen uh, yeah. is important. It, yeah. it, very good. So is there maybe one or two comments from the, from the audience on the environmental footprint, on the citizen acceptance of f factories in the neighborhood? Who would comment? Questions to the speakers on that issue, maybe? Yes. Yeah, I, I thought it was very interesting that you had an urban planning on the pa an urban planner on the panel there. That's a completely different uh, expert than we tend to have on these uh, on these panels. So good to, to have your input. But it seems to be completely different what people are telling now than what was said 40 years ago when they said, well, separate living areas and recreational areas from manufacturing areas. It can't be all to do because we can now manufacture with lower emissions, with a lower footprint. There must be other reasons why this is <coughs> coming back. Could you maybe expand a little bit on that? I would like to take two questions first and then we, we see how we can address them. So you had a question as well here, please. The gentleman here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. My my question is also put as the first one on the screen, and I apologize for the time. <laughs> but uh, what I wanted to know if uh, we are reintegrating uh, uh, industrial places, and uh, this example of the 3D printer in a small shop just brings to my to my mind. Uh, isn't there the danger that we re-import occupational health problems? Uh, how shall uh, a, a, a labor inspector control such a small site where or a single person in the back room of a shop is digitally printing uh, the essential part of a, of a shoe? So just that it came to my, I should, uh, I'm, I don't want to uh, raise any skepticism towards these new approaches. 
but I think we should uh, have learned our lesson from the past and do not re-import problems like occupational health when implementing uh, those new smart uh, approaches. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you very much for the question. So maybe the two questions and then we also take the first one here from Slido. Is occupational health on board when those new production patterns are implemented? Is in sync with your question. So anybody who wants to go first? To the gentleman's question, um, uh, just in relation to uh, why uh, uses uh, you know, industrial, commercial, residential would have been separated. Um, and then the long-term consequences of those decisions, uh, the needs then to uh, move between these spaces. I suppose the introduction of the car um, offered a huge potential uh, to be able to move these uh, noisy, you know, possibly dirty, even dangerous um, materials, etc., away from uh, the residential area. So, if you think back to uh, the the first industrial revolution or the second, and you see though you you barely would have seen your your hand in front of your face if you were in the city with all the soot and the noise and the comings and goings. But with the introduction of the car and the separation of the zoning laws and the regulation in relation to keep being dangerous chemicals, etc., and pollutants away from uh, particularly residential areas um, became a priority and was regulated for. Uh, now what we're seeing is cleaner production, um, less noisy, and people wanting their a reduction in their commute, you know, and products closer to them, possibly made locally by somebody that they know or themselves. Uh, so they want to be much more involved in that making and get back to the craft that would have been there when you think about the very first time we ever made something and sold it. So yeah, zoning now is still very much separated and that is the policy. So uh, the examples that we had from Germany in Stuttgart, you know, are fantastic. And to bring those examples to other communities, to other planners and policymakers, um, so the policy informs uh, the zoning regulations of the future. That's incredibly important. Yeah. yeah thank you for, for this first answer. Maybe to the other question, somebody, or to the same one to complement. Fine. The uh, occupational health, I think this is really important aspect. So uh, we are not experts of 3D printing uh, technologies. We are using 3D printers, uh, but um, I can maybe give an answer on a more general level, uh, because automation and human-machine interaction and human-robot interaction is a, a key aspect. Uh, we are doing research in, in that field. Uh, and always, uh, when it comes to this human-machine interaction, there are safety aspects uh, also they are looked at. And at least when it uh, comes into uh, uh, certification, you have to fulfill some safety regulations. Um, so yes, right from the beginning, this uh, occupational health or safety aspects should be taken into account. Sometimes you do not know uh, the, the uh, let's say, the impact of this 3D printing powder and so on. So I think there is still more research needed for the sake of the employer's health. Okay. Yeah. Two, two, I think. It, it's a two, I think. And uh, there's, there's also maybe you can, we can draw a parallel to how we run restaurants and how actually the quality of the food is there checked on a regular basis. We could think of, of some things next to maybe some, some basic regulations. You shouldn't kill it immediately by too many regulations. Uh, and then we'll, we'll learn along the way. And of course, uh, when you sort of employ yourself and employ others, you have a responsibility that you need to take seriously. Maybe just uh, to add here, I think you mentioned we should not kill new technologies with too many regulations. This is uh, also, when it comes to ethical aspects with artificial intelligence, also the discussion. Uh, and I think here this uh, lab, uh, demo, demo labs or, or uh, these uh, yeah. prototyping areas, they are very crucial to test some new technologies and not to kill them right from the beginning. And to test them maybe without regulation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in, in a controlled environment. Yeah. In a maybe controlled not regulated, but yeah. certainly controlled. Yeah, yeah. in a controlled yes. environment with, with 
relaxing the regulatory aspects of it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a, a, a key aspect. So any comment on that still here? <coughs> then I would go and I, I go a bit towards education, skills, urban areas. Do urban areas sufficiently use the potential of universities that are in the area? So w any comment to that question? I cannot speak for all universities, obviously, but I think there is a lot more knowledge around uh, than one is aware of. So by the time students sort of have their masters, uh, they actually have obtained quite a bit of new knowledge. Usually universities are ahead of the pack in the knowledge they have, but it's not applied yet. And I think we can make much more use of it by, by also uh, yeah, making these students and in, bring them involved in, in projects to share the knowledge and to, to learn together. You also create an ecosystem where your companies can find uh, talent uh, and also your talent uh, learns about reality and, uh, and it doesn't become too academic. So I think there's a lot more we can do. Yeah, anybody else on that? Yeah, just I, I definitely think there's space for universities. It's just as long as the universities are open and barriers to entry don't exist. So like there's a lot of companies or countries, sorry, where privatization of the university education is a huge barrier uh, to learning and uh, a completely polarized society. So uh, children being born knowing they will never achieve a university degree and what happens to them. So there needs to be a, 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 another aspect added in, the open education or, or sharing of uh, knowledge and skills uh, to allow more people um, to access knowledge um, and the potential to, you know, and to be included in this new society. So, yeah. so it's, it's again, the, 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 the citizen has to see the university as a source where he can get yeah, not an ivory tower. And otherwise, yeah. the university mm -hmm. has to also see it as part of their objective to work with the citizen. And, and that yeah. may not be the case when it gets to excellence or so. They may not see the citizen as their clientele. So I think it's important that this comes together. Yeah. Okay. There's so a... then I see a question here. I, I, I would guess that's more directed to me or at least a little bit to me. Why do digital inno and I will try to answer first and then give it to you. Why do digital innovation hubs need to be, be made new? There are already a lot of clusters and hubs out there that just don't know why uh, know they would qualify as a hub. What will be done to be more transparent about digital innovation hub networks and how to become a member? So as being responsible in Connect for Digital Innovation Hubs, I, I see a bit that I'm, I'm challenged here. So let me just make a couple of comments before I go to you. Why do DIH need to be made new? No, they don't need to be made new. We have always said we want to build on what we have. So there, there is a misunderstanding that they need to be made new. We want them to focus. We want, them to, we want to support for certain tasks that they may have to take on board, but we don't want to have anything new where something functioning is existing. So there's no attend, intent whatsoever. Second, there are a lot of around clusters, hubs. They don't know. Yes, we try now to do outreach, but we need the member states to help us because, you know, from, from Brussels, it's very difficult to reach to the bottom. So we work with member states to do that. We work with regions. We go to the week of regions, for example, and, and we try to reach out and from there then get, the, get it more transparent, get them understand. But we rely on the member states to help us to say in their member states which hubs are the ones that should be in, the, in, in, in this European European network. And one thing, it's not just one or two, we allow small consortia, so it can be also collaboration between a small number. So that's my take on that one, but maybe you want to comment as well. Yeah, I think uh, the orchestration of the DIH is incredibly important, um, so that the protections are in place uh, for, you know, the, the, the user. Um, yeah, at the moment, it's kind of a loose term, um, and it's not very open. It's not a very open door policy. Many of these DIHs again are kind of hidden away, as the as the questioner says, and uh, only available to certain certain people who can pay for it. And if we're trying to support 
startups and small scale and cottage industries um, and innovators, uh, there needs to be some strict guidance on the orchestration, who within the region is orchestrating the innovation hubs, and there could be many types and they could be clusters and all of that, yeah. Okay, thank you. So I would like to ask one question now still, but then as the final question I would put to you and I want, would like you to have a kind of 15 second answer on it. When you look at the research instruments we have and what we do, how we support research and innovation, tell me some of the non-generic things, I mean, not what, what everybody would say. What do you think, how can public funding on research and innovation in Europe contribute to these goals that we have identified on urban manufacturing? What could be our contribution? Short, 15 seconds each, after the next question, so I allow you to prepare for it. So one question is now that I would like to ask, and also there I would like to have quick answers, is new business models supporting the creation of jobs. So is there... Uh, kind of a view on that, it's in everybody's mind, we hear it, new business models are coming and others are driven, driven out of business, so how can they help to create new jobs? Who wants to answer, also from the audience? I think they could, but it doesn't mean they do. In the end, I think you need to have a, sort of a problem or something you want to improve and you need to have a solution. And that can be digital, doesn't need to be digital. And then new business models can turn out. But a, business model in, a new business model in itself is a nothing unless these two things come together. So I think you have to think behind the business model, what is behind it, before it becomes valuable. And, and I think this is, this is true in general also for digital transformation. We don't digitally transform for the sake of transformation. We want to, we want to get something exactly. with that. But, but what is, I think what is important is that businesses think about what is their future business model, not just go traditional. And I think that's one of the important aspects in complement, that complements yours. Yeah? I think, uh, yes, you are right. The business models are uh, transforming in the digital era. So it's clear that uh, companies like Festo, almost 100 years old, that we also have to change our business models. The business models are changing towards more cooperative business model, we are working, collaborating in the ecosystem uh, and we are uh, for uh, since several years are also working with startups. So young people coming from the university, uh, we need more young people, fresh ideas and which enables us to, to serve uh, value to our customers. So uh, cooperative business models in an ecosystem. Thank you for the comment on Business models, is there any comment from the audience in that respect? Maybe before I come to the final question, could you tell us the result of the poll? Do you have the result of the poll or not yet? Ah yeah, there it is. So, which aspect of future distributed manufacturing systems or urban manufacturing is most important to focus on at the EU level? So, 32% said, technologies and their uptake for small-scale personalized production. So, technologies and uptake personalized production. Second one on new entrepreneurial and or business models. So the business model comes up to be successful. You have to think carefully. We are not all buying only products anymore. It's, it's beyond that. Environmental footprint, we should support that. And re-industrialization of regions that were losing, I guess. So it's re-industrialization re to bring it back. And I'm surprised it's caused so low, low is the creation of jobs. I would have expected that a bit higher, but uh, that's my expectation. So I would like to ask the 15 second question. How can public funding on research innovation in Europe contribute to these goals? Do you have any quick idea which is a bit out of the box, not what we do? as usual. Who wants to start? It's a challenging, for me, yeah. Please. For me, one of the things is to make things concrete and sort of all sorts of policies, policies and things we have to do, but ideally we come with concrete examples. Concrete. And then, and then we can, uh, I said that we can vent out these examples and do similar things elsewhere. Okay, thank just you. Just learn, learn from each other and just... Uh, I, I, I agree because... We don't scale up, I'm not saying scale up, but do the same thing mm -hmm. somewhere else. Yeah, Asia. Okay, best practice. Learning from, we do. yes, please. Yeah. Um, 
sorry, it's just gone completely from my mind, but I totally agree with you. I think quick testing and trialing and then sharing of examples, uh, but it is quite limited. People are a little bit unwilling to share um, some of their innovations, etc. Uh, I do think there's a little bit of a gap. So from funding for research and innovation, and then the marrying of maybe some blended finance options uh, to help the regions to take what they've learned in the tests and in the in the use cases, and actually then to scale, uh, to, to help them to scale. Because I think a lot of people are caught there in that gap of how do I get this excellent thing out into the world, and it kind of tends to fall away a lot. Okay, yeah. thank, you, thank you very much. Bring that closer together. Martina. Well, I'd like to underline to bring all the research uh, and innovation on the practical view, uh, on the practical side. So the realization of that, um, I'd like to address the focus there because research is the one thing and then to realize uh, these implementations. So um, I would address and sing, think um, that the practical use and the need stands first and yeah, certain innovation might follow. Thank you. Björn, last word. Oh. <laughs> yes, uh, so I'd like that uh, you, European Commission, helps the industry uh, to get better in a dialogue with the broader public, with the citizenships, that it's clear that uh, smart industries are one precondition for uh, good living in Europe. Uh, and that you could help us to attract young people because we need fresh ideas, new ideas, young people which are keen on working on factory, not only digital things, but also this physical manufacturing which is still uh, the key for our living standard in Europe. And keep young people in Europe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yes, thank you very much, all of you, for sharing this with us and uh, asking at least some questions. Uh, we have heard a lot of interesting things. I think we have to now structure this a bit, but I, for me this was very inspiring what, what I have heard. So I, I got new ideas from this and so also maybe what other priorities on, on different things and like bringing factory to people or uh, knowledge need to meet needs, needs to meet knowledge. So these are kind of, even if it's only buzzwords, but it, it helps to, to focus what we, what we do. So thank you very much for being with us here and contributing. Thank you for sharing the session with thank us. Thank you for having us. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.